Hello there, my name is Dr. Josh Franco, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Cuyamaca College. Welcome to our um, workshop on the Civil Grand Jury Lab. Let me go ahead and share my screen, make sure we're up and up, okay? So let's jump right in. So the Civil Grand Jury Lab is a workshop series that I'm hosting that focuses on California's 58 county civil grand juries. Uh, what we'll do is we'll virtually journey through counties throughout California, learn uh, how to navigate their county civil grand jury websites and review a recent civil grand jury report. And our workshops are held Thursdays from 6.30 to 7 p.m. on Zoom uh, during the fall 2022 semester. So the mission or the vision and the mission of the lab. So the vision of the lab is to advance the scholarship and practice of civil grand juries at the local, state, and federal level. And our mission of the lab is to scholastically, socially, and professionally mentor undergraduate students like those of you at Cuyamaca College, uh, as well as those of you who graduate from Cuyamaca College, as well as those of you who are at any community college in California and you're looking for an undergraduate research experience uh, to conduct original research on California civil grand juries, uh, help maintain a database of civil grand jury reports, findings, and recommendations, and local government responses to these reports and develop and disseminate teaching and learning resources on civil grand juries and advance public policy based on those civil grand jury reports. <clears throat> so this is a picture of the civil grand jury advisory committee. Uh, these are former students of mine. So Ishu, Jasmine, Alex, uh, Stephen, and Lydia. I really appreciate their willingness to serve on the advisory committee. We meet, we meet about once a year, so we'll meet again this uh, middle to late fall. Uh, but they are all growing uh, professionals in their fields, uh, legislative, uh, legal, uh, historical, um, recent undergrad, uh, in going transferring Stephen to Santa Barbara and Lydia also uh, budding in journalism. So the grand jury, civil grand jury lab is really focused on providing community college students like yourself, like myself, when I was a community college student, the opportunity to do research. I firmly believe as a former community college student, first generation student, uh, I didn't know the difference or even understand the idea of research. I just thought research was finding information, but research is much more than that. And what I like to do is give that opportunity to my students. Uh, it's because of something I didn't have when I was a student going through uh, the community colleges. So my hope is that you see yourself as a researcher and that you consider the opportunity uh, to conduct work uh, while you're here at Cuyamaca, or if you're at some other institution, I'm happy to work with you as well. So in my heart and in my mind, students are the key. <clears throat> what we do is try to create a mentored research experience. Uh, so this mentored research experience for two-year community college students through which they will develop knowledge, skills, and abilities in the following areas. First, data collection and coding. Uh, next, formal model development and analysis. Uh, third, qualitative analysis using case studies, co uh, comparative case studies, and process tracing. And then lastly, quantitative analyses using statistics and econometric models. So what's the broader impact? Well, first, the goal uh, with these activities will introduce you thoroughly to uh, or thoroughly introduce to your undergraduate students, most of whom are first gen, typically are generally low income or minoritized students to the entire research cycle, right? From beginning to end, how does this work? Next, it can serve as a model for two year undergraduate students conducting original research, uh, knowing that you don't have to wait till your junior or senior year or uh, somehow have to go and pay to get into a master's program or be accepted into a PhD program to start doing original research. You can do that now. Um, as a first year student, second year student, even if you're a high school student taking a college class, uh, I firmly believe that you can learn uh, the tools of the trade and the trade itself uh, so that you're better prepared to make uh, uh, choices about what kind of career paths and other um, uh, ventures you want to take. And then thirdly, it will result in a unique database accessible to students, faculty, research, county, civil grand jurors, state courts, state legislature, media, and interested public. Because what we're doing is going county by county, going year by year and looking at their grand jury reports and collecting data on it. So what's our schedule for the fall? Um, so there was no workshop in week one of the semester. Week two is the overview, which is uh, what we'll be talking about today. And then the workshops from there will be uh, having us travel to a county, looking at their civil grand jury website, finding a report, taking a read through it, and then having a discussion about those things. So again, there was no workshop in week one. So let's go ahead and jump to week two. So our learning objectives uh, with this workshop will be first to define civil grand juries. Second is to describe the history of civil grand juries. Next is to describe reports, findings, and recommendations. And then lastly is to explain how California civil grand juries can inform theoretical models of oversight and accountability. So there's a, a number of slides uh, for this first overview. So it'll go a little bit longer than normal, but I appreciate your guys' time and patience. 
So what's a civil grand jury? Well, California civil grand juries are enabled to oversee operations of local governments. These include cities, counties, school boards, and special districts. Uh, civil grand juries operate in each of the state's 58 counties, and they're domiciled in the county court system. Uh, the number of grand jurors range from 11 to 23, and the mode is around 19 uh, grand jurors per year per county's civil grand jury. And the typical process for civil grand juries includes the following. So uh, formal, uh, the formation um, of the grand jury, the investigation, and then the report out to the public. So what's a little history of California civil grand juries? Well, back in 1849, the state constitution, the founding state constitution of California included grand juries, uh, but there was no documented debate of them at the time. In 1879, uh, state uh, constitution was revised and there was actually a very robust debate on the existence of grand juries uh, but they were sustained and kept in the constitution even after the revision uh, and then fast forward about a century later in 1974 there was a statewide vote on constitutional amendment that moved the grand juries to their own section within an article of the constitution so it actually in my mind made them more prominent than what they were uh, prior to that time and then lastly, in 1982, the California Grand Jurors Association, which is a statewide nonprofit that we're partnered with uh, as a lab, uh, basically to help uh, educate and train the public about grand juries and to uh, encourage people's engagement and service on them, uh, was founded uh, now almost 40 years ago. And uh, we're working with them uh, today to help build this effort out. So how are reports organized uh, of the grand juries? They have typically an executive summary content, findings, and recommendations. So let's unpack each of these. So an example of finding includes this from one of the reports from the San Diego County Grand Jury. It says, fact, San Diego County Charter requires that salaries of members of the Board of Supervisors be established by ordinance of the board. Fact, this charter provision results in supervisors having to vote on the formula which determines their basic compensation as, and as a result, their pensions as well. So a finding of the grand jury was finding number 01, elected officials who set their own compensation and pensions may have an inherent conflict of interest. <clears throat> Here next is an example of a recommendation of a, of a grand jury report. So in 2018, 2019, the San Diego County Grand Jury recommended the following to the County Board of Supervisors. So recommendation 19-24. Uh, consider placing an upcoming ballot and amend consider placing on an upcoming ballot an amendment to section 402 of the county charter which would incorporate one of the following options for setting county supervisors' compensation exclusive of possible cost of living increases so <clears throat> those just kind of gives you a tidbit of of, of what's going on. And we'll obviously over the next few weeks, uh, over the course of this workshop, we'll unpack those for particular counties and particular reports. So what I'd like to do next is kind of share with you a, a simple case study of the County of San Diego Civil Grand Jury. So what I have here is a um, is a chart. Let's see if I can get my pen. So on the Y axis is population and on the X axis is years or in this case, decades. And what we've seen here that in 1970, the population of the county of San Diego was just a little under 1.5 million. <clears throat> and then now in about 2020, the population of the county is approaching 3.5 million. So the county has grown over 2 million people in the past 50 years. And then here's a screenshot of a Google map highlighting the county itself. Obviously we're hanging out here in El Cajon and Cuyamaca College and then the major um, city of the county is San Diego itself. So what are some of the demographics of the civil grand jury applicants from this fiscal year 2018-2019 uh, session? So what we see here on the number of applicants, um, we're here on the in this table, we'll have four, five columns, so race and ethnicity, number of applicants, percent of applicants, percent of the county, and then the difference. So here we see that there were two applicants of American Indian or an Alaskan native descent, seven of Asian descent, uh, nine of black or African-American uh, descent, six of Hispanic Latino, uh, zero for Native American or other Pacific Islander, 142 uh, for white, five for other race or ethnicity, 10 who declined to answer and four who didn't provide. So we kind of see here that um, <clears throat> uh, when it comes to respect to the county itself, uh, itself that there is, um, uh, at least on a racial ethnic level, an underrepresentation uh, of different groups uh, with respect to who's uh, applying to serve on the civil grand jury. So the number of reports and number of governments investigated by fiscal year. So there are 164 local governments in the county of San Diego. 
but only 27 of those governments were investigated by the county during a six-year period, starting from 2013-2014 fiscal year all the way to 2018-2019 fiscal year. So in this uh, time period, 18 governments were investigated once during this time period, six were investigated twice, two were investigated three times, and two were investigated every year of the civil grand jury. Now, when I say the word investigate, you might say, oh, that sounds like kind of scary. Just think about it like a civil grand jury isn't focused on criminal matters, even though it might uncover them. It's focused on the operations of the local government. It wants to know how things are working, how things aren't working, and it wants to document all that in findings, uh, in facts and in findings, and then provide recommendations to that local government about how can it approve, remedy, uh, deal with the issues, or in some cases, sometimes commend them for the work, that, uh, the good work that they've been doing. So in the 2018-2019 fiscal year, the San Diego County Grand Jury issued 11 reports. And here is a table that shows the titles, the number of findings and recommendations. I'll just point out here some of the titles and then we'll get to this, uh, the summary uh, findings and recommendations. So for example, they had uh, a report called Charter School Oversight by the San Diego County Small School Districts. Uh, they had uh, Human Trafficking, San Diego Needs Essential Services, Another one was San Diego Psychiatric Services, the Tri-City Shutdown of Psych Units, Tip of the Iceberg. So there were, across these 11 reports, a total of 74 findings based in facts that were observed by the grand jury and 53 recommendations made to the various local governments that were investigated on things they can do to improve or to remedy the issues that were identified. So <clears throat> let's talk about next civil grand juries and theoretical models. And what I mean by this is... <sighs> As a political scientist, one thing we do is we'll see the world and what's happening in the world. And part of what we do is we try to abstract away the complexities of that reality to kind of see the essence of things. So another way of thinking about it is like, um, someone might say, oh, that's an apple, right? And a theorist would say, well, that's a fruit. Someone might also say that's that's food. And then someone might probably say that's sus sustenance, like it's nourishment, it sustains life. Um, and others might just say in the most general sense, that is an object and in, in a context. And what I mean basically is to say that civil grand juries are these empirical objects. They exist in reality, they operate in reality, they do real work in reality. And as a political scientist, we want to be able to take a step back and ask ourselves, well, what is that? empirical object represent in a more general sense. So in my mind, when it comes to civil grand juries, uh, three kind of constructs come to mind, accountability, representation, and transparency. So accountability, uh, first, uh, this idea of like accountability through elections, right? But the question that comes to mind is like, well, what about non-electoral mechanisms? In other words, we expect to be able to hold our elected officials accountable by either saying yay or nay to another term, but um, what about other ways of holding our elected officials accountable? The next idea is of that of representation. So we typically think we're represented by elected officials, which we are. But the question is, how are appointed officials representing the public? And then lastly, this notion of transparency. So, you know, we expect in, a, in our representative democracy to be some uh, degrees of transparency, assuming it's not related to national security or other things. And even that there's some conversations about, uh, but transparency, right? We expect it. But uh, the flip side of the question is, but what about the role of secrecy in a democracy? So with those kind of themes in mind, some of the prior research on the notion of oversight, the concept of oversight, the the, the a theory of oversight uh, has been informed uh, by national level examinations of the, say, U.S. Congress and state legislatures, by international organizations like the United Nations and uh, uh, international non-governmental organizations. And at the local level, there is some um, analyses of local governments and uh, how they inform oversight, but not that much. So some conceptual questions, kind of these general questions that come to mind. Uh, the first one is, how can our present state of knowledge on oversight, accountability, representation, and transparency be informed by the theoretical essence and empirical existence of these local civil grand juries? Right. So just take a moment to think about the question, and I'll stand here about you know five seconds to kind of give a quiet pause and reread it again. And so what I'm asking here is that there's this thing that exists in the real world. How does it inform our theoretical understanding of these ideas 
of oversight, accountability, representation, and transparency, right? So something in the real world can have us think about more general ideas that we have in our minds, or that is a part of the scholarly debates and conversations. So in addition to these conceptual questions, what are some of these operational questions? So one of them is, what is the effect of a third party actor with complete discretionary investigatory and information revelation power on the behavior of other political actors and institutions, right? <clears throat> so the idea is that if there's this, if there's you and me and others as voters, and then there's local governments, what if there was this third party involved? Actually, let me just draw it here. I got some space. So there's you and us. So we'll call ourselves voters and the government. But what if there was this third party uh, available, and in this case, civil grand juries, and they had, we can hold our local government accountable through elections, right? That's our typical mode. But what if there was this third party here that had the power to say, let us see everything you're doing. And then they had the power to say, as we learn all this, we can then share it with the public. How would that change how the government acts, uh, behaves, makes decisions? So that's like uh, uh, the operational question we're asking. And then next we're asking a measurement question, right? So in this uh, idea here is like, so what's the effectiveness of civil grand juries in the state of California? And some of these measurement questions we have are like, well, how do we define this word effectiveness? Or how do we measure effectiveness? Or what data do we need to properly measure effectiveness? Now, for some of you at this moment, you might be saying, oh, Dr. Franco, it sounds a little too complicated. Or uh, as I classically now apparently say to my students, like, don't overthink it. You guys might be saying, Josh or Dr. Franco, you're overthinking it. Fair, I get you, <laughs> right? But this is what political scientists do. We don't overthink it. We're just asking different types of questions. We're asking conceptual questions. We're asking operational questions. We're asking measurement questions because we're really trying to think through very carefully uh, essentially a theory that we have, hypotheses that we develop, and how we go about uh, empirically or examining those hypotheses in the real world. So what are some data questions that we have? Right. So two that come to mind are how can we systematically collect and analyze the frequency of local government agreement, local government's agreements or disagreement with the findings of the civil grand jury? Another question we can ask is how can we systematically collect the frequency of local governments' acceptance or rejection of civil grand jury recommendations? <clears throat> right, so where we're at, I'll just do a quick back check. We have this kind of theoretical framework, these big ideas. And then we ask ourselves what prior research has informed these ideas? And then now we can generate these conceptual or these kind of general questions. And then we take these general questions and we put them into operation or we start to bring them into the reality, right? Into the real world. And then we ask, well, how do we measure the real world that we're now in? And then what are the data that is presumably going to be measured? What is it? And how can we get it? So if you need to take a pause, this is a recording. So unless you have a question, you can post in the chat. You take a pause here, right? And then you can jump to the theoretical model. And given that we're almost out of time, I think I might just have to call it, leave you in suspense for this theoretical model. But I'm kind of excited. So, you know, for me, this is my jam. Let me go ahead and, and jump through it. So a theoretical model of civil grand juries or a theoretical model of oversight that's informed by the existence of civil grand juries. So there's four concepts I want to bring to your attention. Third party actor, get my pen here, discretionary investigatory power, information revelation power, and the behavior of other political actors and institutions. Now you might say this sounds familiar. It's like, yep, that was a part of our kind of conceptual operational questions that we were discussing a moment ago. So what's a third party actor? Let's define and unpack this. So third party actor, civil grand juries, which empirically represent this form of actor are the public's watchdog 
uh, conducting oversight of local governments. California has 40 million residents that live across 58 counties, and there are 58 civil grand juries that are constituted or formed every year. So we have third party actors in the form of civil grand juries. Next, this idea of discretionary investigatory power. So civil grand juries gets, get to decide which local governments to investigate. They're not told by the courts or by elected officials or by generally the general public. They themselves, the 11 to 23 of them, get to decide which of the local governments in the county are we going to investigate this year. That's, that in and of itself is interesting. Next, the decision to investigate or not investigate, obviously, is an interesting itself. So I'm just emphasizing that point. I got ahead of myself because I'm so <laughs> excited by the topic. And while we can't observe the process of how a civil grand jury decides which local governments to investigate or not, unless we serve on a grand jury, but we're sworn, those who serve on grand juries uh, are sworn to secrecy, so they can't talk about any part of the process internal. So the only way you get to know this uh, process is by serving on the grand jury, and then you have to live with that secret for the rest of your life. Um, so while we can't observe this process of how they decide, we can observe the outcome of the process, which is that we know which local governments are investigated in a given year. So they have discretionary power to investigate. Next, this information revelation power. So civil grand juries, after conducting their investigation, can reveal information to the local government and to the public. So going back to my tripod here, the voters, the government, and the civil grand jury Civil grand jury can interact with the government and ask for any and all information they like. Obviously, the voters interact with the government through elections. And then the civil grand jury decides what information it's going to reveal to the public. Now, revealing information to the local government is valuable because it, break, it can break a log jam of an action with the local government, for example. Revealing information to the public is also valuable because it can increase uh, scrutiny by residents, the media, and local interest groups of what the government's doing. So in this case, when you have information, you can act on it. If you don't have that information, you can't act on it. And what a grand jury is doing is typically providing information uh, that might be available in bits and pieces everywhere. You kind of have to like follow the story or what they'll do is they'll put it all together in a comprehensive report, which we'll be looking at uh, in future weeks um, and have that out to the public for them to digest, engage with, and then have it inform their actions and behaviors. <clears throat> Lastly is this idea of behavior of other political actors and institutions. So political actors like locally elected officials or their appointees, they have to, by law, respond to the findings and the recommendations of the county civil grand jury. Now, this structured interaction between the civil grand juries and local governments is a concrete form of oversight and accountability. Right. So when a civil grand jury, I'll just highlight, draw that picture again, investigates and it sends them that report with findings and recommendations, the government has to respond. And it has to respond to each finding and each recommendation. It's pretty amazing. So what's the puzzle, right? What's How is this idea of civil grand juries, of oversight, of these four components of a theoretical model, like what's what's the puzzle? Like how is this gonna add to existing knowledge or what gap is it gonna try to fill? So it's systematically unknown how frequently local governments agree or disagree with the findings or accept or reject the recommendations of a grand jury. We don't know the top level numbers across the state. I cannot tell you in the last uh, fiscal year, say 20, year 2021 to 2022, across all 58 county civil grand juries, what's the total number of findings? What's the total number of recommendations? And then what was the local government's response? Did they agree with the finding or disagree with the finding? Or did they accept the recommendation or did they reject the uh, uh, recommendation? I can't tell you that. I, no one can tell you that. That's why part of the reason we're doing this work with the grand jury lab, civil grand jury lab, is because we want to know that answer to that question. Next, there's no database of these reports or responses, there's, there, nor there's scholarship beyond articles and some law journals focused on normative arguments as to whether grand jury should exist. So political scientists, what we want to do, and as a social scientist in general, what we want to do is we want to collect the data and we want to be able to have that data available for us to um, help us answer questions that we have. 
So that's part of the work of the grand jury itself. So I'll end with two things, uh, two by two square. So for those of you in my California politics class, you're starting to see this two by two square. And those of you in my American Government 121 class, you don't see the two by two square. So I'm gonna spend a, just a moment explaining it. Um, I might bring it into the political science 121 class in next semester, but we'll see. <laughs> so a two by two square. Uh, I have a tremendous affinity for two by two squares because what it basically does is help to visualize uh, a hypothesized relationships between two variables. So a dependent variable is another word we use, which is a strong word for political scientists, but I'll use it here because I think it's more common. A dependent variable is an effect while an independent variable is a cause. So, you know, we're always, I think most, all of us know the idea of a cause and effect. If it's 102 degrees outside, that cause of the heat is going to affect me in putting on a hat. Or if uh, I have, if the cause of me having an empty stomach is going to lead me to the effect of having dinner. So that's the idea here. So the cause that we're interested in is a civil grand jury report. So IDV or independent variable. And I'm just gonna put here civil grand jury report. And there can be a low value of no report or there can be a high value of yes, there is a report. And the dependent variable here is the local government response to a, a civil grand jury. So we're gonna put LG response. And the low value is not responsive. And the high value is responsive. Now, my hypothesis is that if in the study of local governments that it does not have a civil grand jury report issued to it, so there's no grand jury report given to the local government, that they will not be responsive to a civil grand jury. And if there is a civil grand jury report about that local government, then the response that they will, will be responsive to the local government. Now, we know in the reality that any local government that is investigated and receives a report with findings and recommendations from a civil grand jury, they have to, by law, respond. So in this hypothesis, we kind of know that it's generally mostly true. But then we can start to say, well, how responsive is the local government? So instead of looking at local governments that don't get a report and do get a report, we can say, let's look at the ones who get a report and then instead of just saying responsive in general, we'll say that they are uh, um, they have a low responsiveness or they have a high responsiveness. Or let's say have a, a, a responsiveness is that they're disagreeing or a high responsiveness is that they are agreeing with the civil grand jury's findings and recommendation. So you can start to see how we can take this like initial a two by two square and start to unpack it as questions that we have get answered. Uh, lastly, this analyst perspective. So for those of you in the 121 class, you're seeing this analyst perspective. Uh, if you're in the eight-week class, you're seeing it now. If you're in the semester length class, you'll see it in the second half of the semester. Uh, but these uh, four analyst roles, I like to bring them in. So data, geographic information systems, policy, and communications. So for example, data analysts might be asking themselves, well, what kind of data can we collect from these civil grand jury reports? A GIS analyst might ask, well, which local governments have civil grand juries investigated and not investigated? And we can put a map of that. A policy analyst might be asking, well, how do local governments respond to civil grand jury reports, findings, and recommendations? And then lastly, how do local government, uh, local regional media cover civil grand jury reports and local government responses? So with that, I'm looking forward to your questions and your thoughts. Uh, I do want to do one last thing, which is pull up the Civil Grand Jury website, Civil Grand Jury Lab website, excuse me, let me drop it right here. So it's at cgjlab.com. And here you can learn more about the lab, its activities, about it, frequently asked questions, an application to join, and obviously contact us. <sighs> I love it. So with that, thanks so much for taking the time and the extra time to listen to this recording or to uh, attending, I appreciate it. Um, I look forward to uh, uh, sharing the Civil Grand Jury Lab and our journey through California at Civil Grand Juries over the next uh, uh, a few weeks of the term. And take care and have a great night.